So here we are. Uh, welcome to this hour. And this hour is dedicated to number sense and place value. You already know my name. My name is Minakshi Oberoi. I like this session to be very interactive because it's not about me and I can't tell you anything new. But what I can do is give you some ways which might make sense in our classrooms while we are doing our teaching learning and while we are making significant efforts to make students more engaged in their learning, um, help students understand better, have an in-depth understanding rather than surface uh, understanding, and above all, develop a love for the subject, and that is mathematics. Mathematics is all about numbers. But, you know, number sense and place value form the bedrock of mathematical understanding in primary education, especially. And this plays a vital role in shaping a child's mathematical proficiency. Therefore, we are here today in this session to understand how to uh, strengthen this whole foundation to help and understand how can we uh, help our students form a foundation that can actually help them uh, throughout their lives as they grow and uh, you know uh, nurture the love that they have further by going deeper and wider into this field. Every field that I can think of will use, uh, uh, I think, numbers. I, I, I don't know of a field which we can do without numbers. So if you can think of one, do let me know. But according to, uh, you know, according to what we see around us, I think especially the world of technology and artificial intelligence and other things would be nothing without the zeros and ones, right? So yes, we are in the right place to actually make this foundation really strong so that while the, the foundation is strong, I'm sure what we build from here is going to be only stronger. Yeah, uh, like Vandana has said, uh, please do share all your questions, queries in the chat window. Her eye is on the chat window and uh, she'll be taking the questions from there. She'll answer a few right there. And in between, I'll keep pausing to say, ask if there are any questions. So I think to begin with, you're all comfortable. So we are going to move ahead. Like I said, it's going to be all about you now. That's my question to you. What do the words number and sense or a number sense and place value mean to you? What comes to your mind when I say number sense and place value? You may either scan this or use the uh, you know link that I'm sharing in the chat window. Here you go. I have shared that. You may either click on that or simply just scan this as you like it. And please answer this question. And as you answer, I'm going to bring here your responses. So yes, you will have to remain active. Keep your fingers very active. Either scan this or please go ahead and use the link that is given in the chat window. I will post this once again so that it's available to you. So I've given you the link in the chat window. Please go ahead and help me um, you know, see what comes to your mind when I say the words number sense and place value. I'm going to uh, let this screen, actually, I'm going to share my screen just about once again so that I can share my entire screen, which will allow me to uh, to actually, okay, just give me one second. I'm going to share my screen so that I can toggle and show you all the results that I have, okay? So just give me one minute. Okay, I think you can see my screen, Vandana. Can you confirm? Of yes. course. Yes, you ma'am. Yes, perfect. Oh, look at that. Look at the throw of words. I love it when my participants are this responsive and immediately I get responses. Can you read that? There are numbers, there are tens and ones, but there are more value of a number. Uh, identification of numbers. Okay. Uh, digits. Oh, yes. Numbers, digits. Uh, what else? importance of numbers, understanding numbers. Oh, that is a big one, I must say. Uh, place value. Okay, what else does this bring to your mind when I say, well, it's the number sense. It's the word number sense. Let's see what you get there. Okay, the word number sense. The word number sense, I can read a few saying the number system, uh, place in a number, um, what else do we have? What else do we have? Okay, I, I'll let these uh, you know words come in because it's very important for us to know where you are in your uh, you know uh, in your connection with numbers. So I'm just letting your numbers identification of number position of numbers, 
wonderful. Oh, we have hardcore math teachers in the room. Amazing. Great. So uh, keep these responses coming in. I will, uh, you know, reach back. I have about 76 responses here, which is like awesome. Very good. So one thing is very clear, Vanna, we have an audience which is completely clued in uh, with technology. So we don't need to worry that, you know, I don't know whether I should be introducing this or not. I think you're very proficient. And I will let you uh, go ahead and keep submitting your responses. Well, uh, the particular word number sense is something that uh, I want to decipher. Now, it's it's not just number, it's the number sense. Number sense is the ability to understand and work with numbers flexibly, making sense of their relationship. This word could have been numbers or number system, but it has deliberately been put as a number sense. The next word that we have is a place value, which is like crucial for our understanding but within uh you know what the words that you have given with the meaning of digit in number the place in number the position yes you're absolutely right over there and together both of these will lay a very found uh, a very very firm foundation for advanced mathematical concepts to set in it's uh, easy for me to actually just put it uh, in words like this for you. But for developing number sense, it involves recognizing patterns. It involves uh, making estimations, understanding the magnitude of numbers. And this fosters critical thinking skills and enhances a child's ability to uh, solve mathematical problems. And this sort of a, uh, you know, ability is something that we are looking forward to in our students because I think it's extremely important in today's world for them to understand how these numbers could be used in a very meaningful manner. Talking about importance of numbers, that's one term that I saw over there, which was very prominent. So here we are. What is the importance of this number system and place value? At the risk of repeating myself, I'm so simply just going to say it once again that is a foundation of mathematical success. If you are not good with number sense and place value, the basic mathematical sense success is, uh, is something that we should start doubting. Number two, it must have real life applications. A concept always remains like a concept if we have not been able to decipher it and relate it and make connections with it and bring it to life. Um, um, uh, under, I think, foundational mathematical success, I would put two major things. One is critical thinking and problem solving, and two is math fluency. What do I mean by this? I'm just going to decipher. I I, I don't think I need to explain what is uh, critical thinking and uh, what is problem solving. However, I would want to bring to your notice that, you know, amongst the critical thinking skills, it's not only just application or, you know, making them think in a different way. Whenever I've said the word uh, critical thinking, people have, uh, you know, uh, immediately responded saying thinking out of the box, absolutely thinking out of the box. But critical thinking is also making within the, making them think within the box. What do I mean by that? I'm going to take you through multiple examples. But remember that term that, you know, it's not just about, uh, you know, thinking like uh, outside of box about something to do with numbers or number sense, but also internalizing, uh, realizing and uh, probably, uh, you know, representing the way you have been able to understand and using your understanding to solve problems. Number two, math fluency. Oh, I can't, uh, you know, emphasize enough on mathematical fluency. This is one thing that we all need to build. How are we going to build? I'm going to share certain uh, practices and uh, th that will give you a peek into what do I mean by uh, proficiency and uh, also, uh, you know, the fluency that I have been talking about. The proficiency is ensures that, you know, the students are using uh, the uh, numbers to manipulate these numbers effortlessly. This fluency is essential as you know, it will very quickly help them do mental math calcula calculations and it will help students become more efficient in handling mathematical operations. Therefore, to build fluency, what is it that we are going to do? I'm going to talk about that too. Real life connections, preparing for advanced concepts, not just, uh, you know, making a connection, let's say a number and representing a number, but in the larger picture, where are these going to take us? What is the advanced concept where we are going to apply this? And we always shy of sharing this because we feel it should be 
grade specific or class specific that I should not talk about this. But what we need to remember is students are looking at so many things. I mean, they're so aware these days. And while they're aware, we can only enhance and enrich what they do. Last but not the least, enhanced mathematical communication. Do you know that uh, advanced medical mathematical concepts, oh, by the way, when I say advanced mathematical concepts, what I mean is uh, not just addition, subtraction, uh, you know, multiplication, division, but also building blocks for the complex mathematical ideas that they're going to have for tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, as far as the communication is concerned, it's very simple. So a, a child who will be proficient in number sets and place value will be able to communicate their mathematical reasoning very effectively. Now, what helps them build their thoughts and make them more confident in discussing or in sharing their understanding is language so i'm going to do a lot of uh you know example sharing i'm going to take you through a number of exercises which i feel uh, i have found success in and i sincerely hope uh, you do to uh, find success in that so uh building proficiency let me take a dip into this because i understand that you know uh, things that we do in our class uh, is is what is already present so what else what next is it that we need to do so let's say there's a task where we all do uh, place value puzzles, right? Uh, what we could do is, uh, you know, provide them cards zero to nine. I wouldn't mind picking up Uno cards. Why? Because when we create cards, it becomes like a mathematical concept. But we need to tell our students that even in your daily lives, you know, you have uh, Uno cards, you have playing cards, pick up any of those cards and it should, you should have number zero to nine and ask them to create a three digit number, four digit number, seven digit number as your grade, uh, as it applies. And then challenge them to break it down into place value components. And this hands-on reinforces the understanding of place value because they're going to work independently. This is also a part of adaptive learning. So what happens is you are giving them a chance to recreate that number rather than, you know, a teacher writing on the board to explain or giving them exercises to do. Many have argued that, you know, worksheets also um, serve the same purpose. What worksheets will not allow is manipulation. Now, when the cards are physically in your hands, what you like to do is you like to place them. You like to think whether this is correct or not, and you can make those changes over there and manipulate. Now, that's what helps building proficiency. Let me take another example. Number line exploration. Who doesn't do number line in their class, right, while teaching numbers? Now, students, uh, when we give students large number lines and a set of random numbers and ask them to place numbers correctly on the line, emphasizing the concept of magnitude and distance between the numbers. Yes, emphasize on the concept of magnitude and distance between the numbers. The task enhances their ability to visualize and manipulate numbers on a number line. I know many of you would have tried this. I've tried this uh, experiment too in my class. It's not an experiment, it's an activity, actually a task and engagement. Um, I wrote uh, six digit numbers on uh, because Till five digits, students still understand the magnitude of, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of uh, placement that is there. But when it comes to large numbers, they start getting confused. So we took a stack of uh, numbers with the five digits, six digit and seven digit numbers and seven digits were just about to introduce to the class. At that time, we asked them to uh, take a card. Uh, randomly group 10 students. So there were only 10 students in a group. So I understand the large numbers that we run in the classroom. You could reduce this to eight or six, or as you like it, sometimes I've even played with quads that, you know, four of you, because you're sitting in a class, you don't have time to, uh, you don't have space to move. But if you turn around, you will have four students facing each other at least, right? So you have these four cards. Now discuss. And now create a number line on your own tables. Super simple, right? What, what does this do? If you give them an opportunity like this, they get a, an opportunity to talk and discuss. They negotiate with each other. They voice what they understand. They share with each other what they understand. They negotiate with each other. And that brings in much more clarity and that builds not only mathematical communication, but also fluency as well. So they line it up and then 
they check each other's work. So rather than teacher giving away the answer, we make them think not just once, but twice. Once with the numbers that their group has. And the next one with the table next to them, the way they have arranged without moving much. And if you have space, well, uh, you could actually create uh, the largest number line possible with a whole class. I've done this when we stood in the, um, uh, in the, in the corridor and we said, line up, but line up according to the number that you have and from smallest to largest. Doesn't take long. It can even be done while, let's say, you know, I'm about to start my class and my students are coming back from a PE art or music class into their own classroom. Stand outside with cards, take five, seven, 10 minutes, let them arrange themselves. They understand the concept of standing in a line. They understand to communicate. They understand finding each other. And you will suddenly see they are playing, uh, you know, uh, they start uh, grouping themselves. All five digit numbers, uh, in the front, all seven digit numbers towards the end, all uh, six digit numbers in the center. Now let's just stand with the smallest one first and the largest one. And then I have question cards and that's where I uh, start asking them. Okay, so which is the largest five digit number here? Which is the smallest six digit number here? If I were to say, I'm going to take away Every three out of the cards, the, every number three of the cards that you have, rearrange yourself. Oh, you should see the buzz it creates. You should see the way it, they start thinking about mathematics and not just doing it. So depending on the kind of time that you have and the kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the space that you can afford, go ahead and try this and let me know how it works. Third one. Number board games. Who doesn't like a board game, isn't it? Board games are so interesting. Now, whether you're playing a bingo or you're doing a bond match, it really depends on what you're doing. But num uh, board games are something, uh, uh, sorry, those are bond games. Bond games are something that, uh, you know, enable deeper understanding of the numbers because they have to decompose and recompose. Some of the examples I just gave you in the last one. I'll give you another one where uh, we ask students to design games. So rather than us, we always tell them, uh, think of a game, a board game that you really like and create your own game to create a number bond game. So it, it just works well. Instead of me sitting down to design and draft, there are a number of games that come up and on a weekly basis, we do a rotation or we choose three games to be played over the next two days and then we do a rotation of the next two games. So this way, while the students have worked in the group of threes or fours or pairs, there are a number of games that get created in a classroom. Uh, these are all DIYs. So you can actually pick up a, a reuse a chart paper or something to create these kind of games, a board game or something. Get a simple cardboard to create it as students like it. So you start, what do you start doing is you start giving the learning in the hands of students. You have told them what you wanted to. Now it is their time to actually recreate what is required. Yeah. So I'm going to take a pause here and ask Vandana. Vandana, do we have any questions before I move onwards? Oh, uh, no, ma'am, not as of now, uh, but a uh, few teachers have raised their hands. So I would request, ma'am, if you have any questions, you can use the chat box. Yes. Uh, there is a, uh, there's one from Saloni, ma'am. I have re recently started with the topic composing and decomposing numbers, and I did not stick to the classroom smart board. I use hula hoops and balls, leaves, play-doh and blocks as well. There you go. You have done it. Wonderful. And wait and behold, because I have many more ideas. Take them to your class and do let us know how you uh, how how it could change learning. Do observe the impact that this change brings into learning when you start using all of these. I'm so happy to know that you did that. Uh, one from Manisha, ma'am, that we can also use place value kit activity. Absolutely. There is a, I think there's a very warm place in our hearts as far as uh, the mathematical kits, uh, use of mathematical kits are uh, concerned because they bring in a lot of value. They have been very thoughtfully designed and have been placed in a classroom for a purpose. And yes, if they are used in the right manner, they can actually help you deepen and widen learning. 
Uh, one from Shalini, ma'am. Uh, I write on the board the number digit and let them to read and make them to solve, giving them the confidence that whatever they are doing it right. Oh, yeah. You know, we do mystery numbers and I have one for you. Uh, so while we move onwards, I'll show you my mystery number game. I love that game because they have to decipher. Therefore, they start thinking about it. Yeah. So, yes, ma'am. No more questions. Okay. Thank you, Vandana. So, yes, please keep your thoughts and questions uh, coming into the chat window. Would love to hear. Oh, look at that. You talked about mystery number challenges. Love doing this. So, what we do is we provide these mystery cards to everybody in the classroom. And students use these to uh, close to deduce and identify the mystery number. How this works is that, you know, um, it'll have uh, this in tens place, ones place, and, uh, you know, hundreds place. And tell me what the number is. It's greater than this or less than this and this activity just encourages critical thinking and application of place value concept i would uh, not shy away from saying this is one of the strongest ways in which you can bring in uh, critical thinking you can bring in communication you can build uh, mathematical fluency and also you will see the quietest of the voices heard when you start playing games like these in your classroom to give you a glimpse, here's the game, but I'm not just here to give you a glimpse. I'm going to make you play this. So here's your challenge. There are four boxes here, A, B, C, and D. Go ahead and answer as many uh, as you can within next 30 seconds. And my eye is on the clock. 30 seconds to give your answers, A this, B this, C this, and D this. Go for it. I have started my timer of 30 seconds. Give me your answers in the chat window, please. So, ma'am, we have few answers. Uh, first, 1037, 1307 from Meghna, ma'am. Harshida, ma'am, 1037. Kimi, ma'am, 1037. 1037, yes, from Meghna, ma'am. Purnima, ma'am, 1037A. Look what happened. Within these 30 seconds, our chat window went from some 50 responses to 90 plus responses. How does this happen? Everybody's enthusiastic about participating. Isn't it, Vanna? Isn't it such a joy to see our chat window just filled and I knew Vanna will not be able to read all the responses, but here we are. I mean, look, we got your brain sticking. Abna, ma'am, 1109 for C. Yes. Yes, keep them coming because I just got you thinking. So. Give me ma'am B one one double two O B triple one two Jimmy ma'am. Yeah, there are so many responses. Yeah, there are so many. Thank you, Vandana. Uh Thank you and, you know, a big round of applause from us to you because you all have done fabulously well. You started thinking. Uh, what I'm doing over here is even if I'm talking about hardcore concepts, but I'm pausing here to engage you. That's something that's very important. Look at number B. The number B has special place in my heart. Why? Because the mystery number has a one in the thousand, a place, a two in ones and a two in tens. It's not the right order. And you have repetitively used that number. It just gets your students to think and, you know, they start writing to here and there. So what they're doing is while their eyes are moving really fast to see where to place, their brains are helping them develop understanding of where they should place this. So they're negotiating with themselves. They are understanding while you're also doing it. You would have also spent that two minutes to just think, not two minutes because I gave you 30 seconds, probably five seconds to think before you actually placed the number where you were supposed to place it. So yes, these are some of the ways. Here are some more ways. I love using everyday stuff in my classroom. This one are my favorite ones. They're just paper cups. They're always used and thrown away. And uh, yeah, styrofoam is not used anymore. But even if they're paper cups, just stack them up. Ask students to roll whichever way they want to. Do four digit, three digits, five digits, seven digit numbers, as you like it, nine digit numbers. Ask them to roll and write the number. Roll again, write the number. Roll again, write the number. It's just playful. It's just nice. Another one, dice is never failed. So please go ahead and use dice. I uh, ask students to bring dice and then they have to, uh, you know, not only 
come up with the next number, but also answer a couple of questions that are related or connected to that question. So that is building in my mathematical fluency. Not sure if you've ever tried the place value sliders, but this is one of the simplest way and a reusable way. So we normally, what we do is we put it on a used chart paper and we ask the students to write number one to nine, make a slider over there, uh, take it from in between. Take help from your art teachers. After all, this is where we use resources within our school and enrich our rooms, right? So go ahead and make these sliders available. You can play so many, you can have so many concepts running with this. The slider can change and the number strips remain the same. So uh, literally from grade one to grade literally five, I could easily see these place value sliders working and sliders you can even use for addition, for subtraction, uh, you know, roll the slider wherever it stops, note the number, and now next roll again and, you know, slide it again and then see where it lands. Similarly with dice and the cups. Up to you. I'm just trying to give you some ideas. While math kits are something that are scientifically built and are very important, these kind of resources which are handy and around me, I can just pick up and go. Here are some strategies. Now, see, uh, strategies for teaching these uh, concepts could be hands-on. Again, now I'm taking reference of both, uh, you know, NCF uh, 2023 and NEP 2022. And of course, keeping in mind the way uh, learning happens in Cambridge schools. These, uh, you know, uh, none of these boards uh, actually stop us from teaching the way I, we teach. They only define the topic that needs to be taught. The pedagogy is up to us, the way we adopt it, the way we want to carry forward. Getting hands-on, there is no choice. I think today, if in your class you're not getting hands-on, there's something huge that is missing. And I'm sure each and every uh, individual who has joined us here, you must and must be uh, doing multiple hands-on activities. And I'm going to share uh, some more with you just to add to your platter. Uh, visual representations. We can never find enough time for visual representations. Therefore, we sh should uh, try and make it interdisciplinary. That is something, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to jump from here to here and make connections because one engagement itself will give you so many uh, of these, uh, you know, uh, strategies covered together. So while you're doing visual presentations, if you're not able to do it, please involve your art teachers, involve your music teachers, involve your PE teachers, involve your... Um, uh, involve your technology teachers, anybody whom you can, uh, let them know that you're doing this in your classroom. And just as a warm up, even if as a warm up, they can engage their classrooms uh, using your concept. They're not only building their uh, the concept that they want to teach, but also the concept that you are teaching in your classroom. And it doesn't seem like a subject or a topic related uh, learning. And I'll give you examples to show that. Real world connections, I think I've spoken enough. Interdisciplinary, we are at the uh, we are at the cusp of that change where we are looking for integration and that too mindful integration, intentional integrations into every subject possible. So my major intent is here today to show you those integrations because time and again we've been asked to share examples related to uh, you know tasks being interdisciplinary, inclusive. We have varied learning styles and differentiated levels is what we need to accommodate. We need to be inclusive by nature. We need to include all types of learners, visual, auditory, uh, kinesthetic, um, linguistic, all kinds of learners, uh, and also the abilities within a classroom. Now to bring in parity, uh, we know we always have our lesson plans, but when we give opportunity to students, to showcase their understanding or demonstrate their understanding or give them an opportunity to learn a particular concept in various ways. So uh, they catch it. You, you, you don't even come to know what was the best way for this child to learn. But if you bring in that variety, all we know is learning will happen. And that's what we are looking at at the end of the day. Social emotional learning is something that I put over here because especially post-COVID, it has a special place in education. And I think while we are doing our everyday tasks or while we are teaching and learning every day, if we have a small element of social emotional learning in our uh, teaching learning, believe you me, it will go a long way into promoting positive health and well-being 
And I think it is our responsibility as teachers to include social emotional learning in every aspect of uh, education. Competency-based learning. Oh, huge word. How am I going to do that? We're going to show you because all competency-based learning says is meet the learners where they are. Let them know where they are and build their competency. How are we going to do that? Well, it's not going to happen towards the end during assessment. No, it's going to be an ongoing process. Therefore, with every element that I speak about, I'm going to touch upon that. I don't think we have a choice about using of use of technology. Whether we like it or not, children are going to use uh, devices, even if not on a weekday. On a weekend, a child will pick up a device. And if the child picks up the device for a purpose and that to an academic purpose, I think even parents wouldn't mind that. It's all right. Have a timed activity done using technology. Within classroom, use technology if you can. So many of you have said you have smart boards. You have ability to bring in technology in your classroom. My question is, how are you using it? So I have some ideas there. I'll share those as well with you. Okay, huge slide, but uh, pardon me for bringing in too much together with use of technology because I want to get this out of our way. Use of technology. You have whiteboards. Do activities on whiteboards. Do an interactive activity. So what we do is, let's say, you know, we use uh, a, a whiteboard um, within Teams or Microsoft whiteboard or whatever whiteboard you use, uh, or the virtual one. Uh, leave a mystery number over there because you can't accommodate in your class. It's all right. Leave a mystery number there. Leave a mystery statement there. Leave a puzzle over there. Let them use. And the good part is, technology will let you know who's written what. So your students have a virtual, uh, uh, you know, PlayStation for them, which you have created, and it's connected with what they're learning in the classroom. There are di digital manipulatives that are apps that are available. Please use, there are a number of uh, base 10, uh, you know, fun activities to do. So there are a number of apps out there. Please use those. Digital games and quizzes. I don't need to tell you. I love Kahoot. If you have not used, please use. Uh, Cambridge themselves have uh, their own platform. I'm sure you're using that. It has multiple interactive worksheets. Interactive worksheets allow you uh, to make mistakes correct and also get responded to right there and then. Like in uh, you know forms, we have an ability where if you mark the correct answer, uh, the if the child has attempted it wrong, there will be a reason behind why is it wrong. Because normally what we do is it either it is right or it is wrong. We do not have time to accommodate what is right and what is wrong. Therefore, it's it's a great way to actually let them learn on their own as well. Augmented reality, no match to this, I'm telling you. So if you can bring a real uh, world object into the classroom, fantastic. Otherwise, AR, VR capabilities built within your systems are amazing. There are multiple apps for that as well. Online simulations. Um, most of the times, like I said, most of the times, this is a partnership between the ICT teacher or the computer science teacher and the mathematics teacher, where we request them to use certain uh, apps and tools which can help our students explore and experiment with place value concepts. Digital storytelling. Oh, I love this like anything. I have one uh, physical one for you, but try a digital storytelling. There are multiple tools that can help students, uh, you know, visualize and show you. So I use this activity a lot, even in PowerPoint. You're using one right now. I use Adobe Express for that. I use I use multiple tools for that. But what do I do over there? I tell them um, there are uh, these uh, images or, you know, elements, which means like some pictures of blocks or fruits or something that I leave. And I say, hey, go ahead, uh, make some sense out of these objects to uh, uh, to talk the language of, uh, of numbers. So let's say uh, four bananas and three apples and uh, 10 grapes met. What happened? And, you know, build a story. So here is a story. I have a story prompt. So they have to design characters. They have to design the setting. And they have to show me what happened. So they have to create an image so that that conveys their understanding of place value and number sense. Uh, educational videos. Well, there are enough uh, out there. You have, uh, you have focused uh, content uh, providers. 
uh, like Khan Academy or, you know, um, or others and even Cambridge for that matter. So you have all of those available with you. Please use those. I'm sure you do. But there are a lot of videos that are amazing. Uh, they just help reinforce what you have just taught. And uh, digital portfolios are my favorite on this screen because, you know, when children are learning, they don't realize that they started when they came to this class, they started on a three digit number. Now they have a capability to manipulate and uh, handle four or five digit numbers. The growth can be seen in that portfolio. And that's something amazing of you. So please include a lot of images, uh, anecdotes, uh, written reflections from students. They themselves start to realize that, oh, this is what I'm learning each day. But otherwise, you know, it's like one chapter after another into another grade into another grade. What we don't find time is to stop for reflections. Please pause to look back to see uh, here I was in my learning. I have learned as much. I've arrived here. I'm yet to learn this much. So that kind of a continuum is very important for students to realize. You and I know that because we know our students day in and day out, we meet them, right? So, but parents and students, I believe, need this reflection, need a peek into what is it that, uh, you know, I'm learning. So I hope that helped. So um, let's see some, uh, you know, strategies in action. I've spoken so much. I would want to pause, uh, show you some things and uh, probably even give you a task to do. Yeah, all set. Okay, stay set, please. Um, guesstimate the number of balls in this image. Go ahead. Give me in the chat window, please. Guess or estimate the number of balls in this image. Saloni ma'am has mentioned 100 under Yatish Kumar 30 to 40. Yatish Kumar sir, Kimi Jan ma'am 50. Manisha ma'am 30. Aprajita ma'am 50. Tabi ma'am 60. Mary ma'am 40. Nuri like ma around 70. Yeah, like they say, the temperatures rising here, the are the numbers <laughs> rising. Ritu okay. ma'am 50. Yeah. Prachiti ma'am, 80. Awesome. Keep them coming. You know yeah. why? Because I'm going to change my strategy. I'm going to ask you not the number of images now. I'm going to ask you what was your strategy to count the balls? That's what is more important. I want to know how did you start counting? Or were you really just guesstimating? Estimation is excellent, but estimation must also have some base. It's not a random throw that we are going to do. So what did you use? What was your strategy to count these balls? Share with us. Estimation. How did you estimate is more important? Yes, focus on color, counting. Estimate according to colors, number of rows into number of columns based on colors around 10 in one row then count the number of rows colors number of balls of each color fantastic you know what this is exactly what you should be looking for i got this game here it's just a random fun game right and you started estimating according uh just very quickly some of you took some time it's not important how many balls are there in this image. What's important is what is the strategy that you use? Because these strategies are what we have to teach to our students. My instruction should not have been guesstimate the number of balls in this image. It could have been, again, it could have been use the colors to find out how many yellow balls, orange balls, red balls, pink balls, purple balls, and green balls, and then tell me how uh, guess to tell me how close are you to your guesstimate. So I'm going to take first strategies, ran random guesstimate, just about guess, right? The other one is user strategy. Uh, group them from the le left side or, you know, divide this picture into half, start from left to right, top to bottom as you like it. But what's your strategy? So while you engage your students in these kind of uh, activities, What's most important is how are you dealing with this? What is the strategy that you're using? And we've got some amazing strategies in our uh, you know, chat window. And right now, what did we do? 
we included both math and scientific uh, science integration. This is scientific observation. There is a pragmatic approach in which you are moving, you're planning, you're uh, taking this estimation into uh, a wider arena of thinking about estimated, not just guesstimating. Yeah. So that's a journey that you have just taken. If I were to ask you to reflect right now, you would say exactly this, that initially I was guesstimating. Then I thought I have time. So I started strategizing to count that let me see at least how many uh, you know balls are there actually in this picture. And let me not just throw some numbers just like that. So you move from guesstimating to estimating using a strategy. And this way you can have estimation stations what are you going to do on these stations? Let's play. We are going to place various objects. For example, jars, everyday jars. Literally, go to the kitchen, uh, uh, take pick a shelf on the uh, on your on the counter. Guesstimate how many dried flowers in this, how many dried wood over there, how many tablets kept over here, and how many leaves there. Just about guesstimate. It doesn't consume your time, but it helps the child, uh, you know, uh, uh, helps the child build thinking skills, critical thinking skills. They reuse the strategies that you are using in the classroom. And what they're also doing is they're making connections to, the, uh, to their surroundings and to the real world. Here's another one. Uh, here's a real world connect that I love to do. I ask them to blindfold and uh, pick up the, uh, you know, uh, 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 pick up the Q-tips, pick up these uh, uh, sticks and pick up some cotton balls. And now guesstimate how many did you pick up? How many is a huge skill? You're picking out with the four fingers, but how many balls, uh, cotton balls can you pick out? How many sticks can you pick out? And how many Q-tips can you pick out? Will be very different. It's just a guesstimation that how many do you think you would have picked up? And now, you know what students do? They're very smart. They start feeling the sticks uh, to know. And that's a good thing. At least they are using some strategy. They're thinking about it. So whatever strategy they use, this kind of a blindfold game really, really helps. And if you can see the jars are wide mouthed so that they can pick up uh, these kind of sticks. Who doesn't like a candy store? But who likes going and guesstimating in a candy store, right? So, you know, when you ask a child that when you go to a candy store, you see so many candies. And you can only pick up about 10 candies or, you know, uh, out of any jar that you want. Which one would you want to pick up? Which one would be quicker? But you have only one minute to pick up. Wh which jar do you think you're going to choose to go and pick up? Which is the easiest to pick up? How many are handleable? How many, how easily will you be able to uh, take 10? But you can only take 10 out of a particular jar. So which all jar would you like to go to to pick up the candies? And after doing this with a picture, please do give them something because showing them a you know, complete candy store really prepares you for at least one candy in the classroom. So uh, these are some of the examples that I wanted to share. And here's my favorite one, which I tell my parents. So during PTM, please involve parents. They also love, you know, ideas on games. So on our PTMs, what we used to like to do is we used to on our boards, not just display students' work because those were kept as portfolios on each student's table. On the uh, boards, please uh, share strategies to practice these concepts with their uh, children. So we used to tell them, make a parking lot in the classroom. So let's say we have the four walls. Sorry, the three walls available. The fourth is mine. But the three walls, because you have the blackboard or whiteboard there. So the three walls, again, the three walls, we're going to make a car's parking lot. Put your name. And next to your name, take some blocks or take any object that you want and represent that uh, uh, the your car number. So they have to recall or find out the four-digit car number that they have of the car that they own. And then, uh, you know, place these objects. And then we have to go and guess that, you know, which which one uh, is, uh, is whose or, you know, where have you parked your car, put them in an ascending number or whichever way you want. From there on, you know, it's your play field the way you want it. But it'll cover numbers, four digit numbers. It'll cover place value. It'll cover uh, greater than, let's say, and it'll cover ascending, descending as you like it. So I love doing this game. And then we ask them to repeat this game at home. Look at the cars in your lane, note down some numbers, make a representation and make a parking lot of your own and show it to us. So I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions or comments in the chat window. 
Ma'am, uh, we have one question in the Q and A from Faisal, Ma'am. How to handle absent students next day present again? Basically, understand not complete course. So you know, my strategy for that used to be, I used to take a lot of pictures while this game was being played, and I used to make a kind of a timeline. And let's say I had this picture, I would just put it there. It's not only for students who were absent. But also students who are still interested in that game and beyond that 40 minute period, they want to carry on playing with it. So my math board used to have a complete, uh, you know, image of what was done in the classroom. So let's say I've given them a picture, I would just put it over there. So no creating more uh, resources for this. Simply just take the pictures. Of course, put them on a, uh, you know, I used to put them on a PowerPoint slide, print one black and white picture and put it there. We always don't have to be the ones who can help students cover up what they have missed out in their classes. Students, while playing with, uh, you know, each other, will tell what happened if you were not there in the classroom. This is how we played the game. So we buddy up. We let students convey that understanding. I hope that helps. Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. Now we have one more question from Anshika, ma'am. How to teach parking lot for five plus? Ah, uh, so. Uh, five plus, you know, you're still lucky. Good you didn't ask for six. But these is number plates. We'll have, let's say I'm in Haryana. So it'll have HR something 98 and then four digits. So your six digit numbers can be covered. Okay, one more from Nishi, ma'am. How to frame car parking questions related to only four digit numbers? Um, take your usual questions. What are your usual questions? The whole thing is thinking has happened by now. They have done a visual representation of the number. Now they know how to manipulate this number. If you were to buy a new car, which number would you like to replace in this? Now write your new number, write it in words, write, write, uh, write it in, uh, represent it again. Uh, okay, which is your favorite number out of the four numbers? If you were to place that in the place of thousands, how will the number change? Uh, so, you know, not just basic questions about representation, but manipulation of numbers, changing of positions, places, uh, probably asking for replacement of numbers. That's what I would do. Thank you, ma'am. So, yes, we can continue. Uh, one more, uh, we use for five plus like international number system and Indian. Yeah, this can be used both ways, right? Okay. Okay, we can continue. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think number sense is a good intuition about numbers and their relationships. If you realize when I gave you that, uh, you know, whole uh, uh, balls image as well, with every image that came in next, your intuition started working and you were already counting. So I had already, you know, taken you into the zone of counting. Whether I asked you to count or not, you started building relationships and it develops gradually. And as a result, you're exploring numbers. You're visualizing them in a variety of contexts and relating them in ways that are not limited by just tr traditional algorithms or traditional uh, ways of, uh, you know, teaching and learning the way we work. So I'm going to do a lot of math talk. Now to convey their understanding, students need a language. Every teacher, I've always said this in many forums that I've uh, you know been to, and I'll re-emphasize, every teacher is a language teacher. So mathematics teachers are no different. How can I help my students talk? You can help them talk by doing this. The strategy is while you're counting the balls, they know and they only start speaking out numbers. None of you also must have said a, a complete sentence, but we are developing language for our students. Now, while I'm not even saying, uh, you know, use your strategy, I could use some language. I began by, I thought I should. I immediately started. My eyes went straight to, I saw, and I used. Immediately, I'm asking for strategies. I'm not just asking for numbers. Look how the game changed. I don't have to force them into doing this, but my language is such that it will drive them into sharing their understanding. This is math plus science plus language. Integration couldn't have been simpler than this, isn't it? Well, if I keep moving over here, here are many more sentence starters. When we look at a number like 347, the three in the hundred place means dash. Now we as teachers speak this way. We talk in complete sentences, but for students, we normally give them fill in the blanks but we need to empower them to be able to speak the way we speak. 
in the numbers, uh, number two, we've simply just said that, you know, in the number five to nine, the value of two is, now this is a sentence starter. But the following numbers, the student should be able to talk this kind of a language once we've given them. The number 416 can be broken down into hundreds, tens, and ones as. So it is important to encourage our students to use complete sentences. I spoke about storytelling. I love doing storytelling in place value. Create a story problem that involves characters, settings, and events. Must include a problem and a solution. For example, if each character has three apples and how many apples are there in total? Simple, nothing difficult, but some kind of a problem and solution. You're immediately teaching language, English, and you're also giving them a skill of storytelling and teaching them place value as well. So you're applying their understanding over here. This could be one of your formative assessments. I love taking such formative assessments rather than just making them do worksheets. I love giving them assignments like these. Here's another one. This is going to be really nice. Peek into the past. Now, uh, you know, when the students are a little older, we like to treat them older. But there's a child in everyone that just doesn't die, right? So we must start with, uh, the, they start asking questions like, Man, why are we learning all of this? When did these numbers start? So, you know, uh, their curiosity starts. And if we can ignite their thinking at that time, nothing to beat that. So place value is basically, we all know, and I've been saying this since the beginning of the webinar, that this is a fundamental concept in mathematics and we have to understand it. Where did it start? It started in the Egyptian or the Babylonians. No, but it is believed that Brahmagupta introduced the concept of zero, but did he? Development of uh, algebra and higher mathematics happened next. But what about now? Well, there are a number of things that actually depend on numbers. They need to know about this evolution. This is math plus history, plus language come in together. I, I, can, I can go on and give you many more examples. Let's go places, geography, or just about a world map. Every class has a world map. And if it doesn't, they must have. All I need to ask to, them to do is, now that you know where these civilizations are, locate them on the map so that you know how far and how where all do numbers travel. So that's math, history, geography, and language put together. I'm only going to make these engagements richer each time I move my screen. Here's my game. Who doesn't like playing game? Gamification is the name of the game. So I play a game where we say, I have 100. Who has this? So that way, you're making them play two ways. I have a 250. So the child who will have, uh, you know, words written in uh, place value, that child and this child have to match. So there are two matches. So there'll be three uh, children who will be matching together. I have who has find the match is amazing. This brings in math, games, language integration. It helps collaboration. It brings in critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. And very learning styles are being catered to as well over here. Um, apart from this, there are, again, oh, musical chairs is something I love. Look at those numbers over there. Such simple numbers. No? Now you can add whatever you want. Now children have to actually play musical chairs according to the numbers cards that they have until they are left with. There's a whole game on musical chairs. Think about it. How are you going to design yours? Let's make some moves. Dance moves. Patterns. Dances have patterns. Numerical patterns can be related a sequence of three steps or two steps, you know, three steps forward and two steps back, whether it's ballet or bhangra, it could be anything, right? This develops a student's understanding of the pattern in real life and also kind of cyclically get involved in it. For example, I love doing this in my sessions. I always say, let's clap. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, and one, two, three. Now that's a pattern, right? But I'm engaging my body. And the minute I engage my body, my whole body starts responding to this engagement. I love doing art projects. And at art projects, we do, uh, you know, let's make a pattern on the wall. This is just about a glass. Imagine outside of uh, your windows, this has been made by students to put up. Here's another one. Love, love, love doing this. This is again art. Here, a number is given, one, one, two, three. A graph sheet is given. And the child has to use uh, for every, uh, you know, uh, the place value, they have to use a different color. For example, here the child has used yellow, 
uh, orange and red. Now you have to represent this on a graph. As you start representing this, you start thinking about every box that you're coloring. So just imagine how this these children are actually creating a patterned quilt, but they are thinking while they are coloring. Here's visual arts. Of course, you know, to create collages is something uh, our art teachers can do very well. Take their help, ask them to uh, identify patterns, ask students to subtly introduce numbers into it, and let them make this artistic creativity with pattern recognition. Math, games, language, physical activity, art, social emotional learning, and inquiry integration. How far can I go with these? Very far. Social emotional learning. That's something I'll pause to talk about because that's something I haven't brought into cognition yet. So a simple question like, what's your favorite two-digit number? Share a memory or experience related to your favorite place in a number. So simple, isn't it? Well, exactly what I was trying to do in an earlier activity, but just giving it a twist of social emotional learning. So I've in integrated almost everything here apart from inquiry. Here are some interesting inquiry-based questions. Imagine you have a mystery number and the digit in tens place is twice the digit of ones place and the digit in hundreds place is one more than the digit in tens place. What could the mystery number be and how did you figure it out? Now, whether you leave it on a whiteboard, put it on your class board or probably, you know, put, a, put it in a, a learning pockets in your classroom, up to you. Here's another one. You have a collection of objects and each group has a specific number. If you arrange these groups in order, Starting from the smallest to largest, how many can you organize? How would you uh, organize them? How does this relate to place value? Now, they are trying to explain to you rather than you telling them that how are they using these objects to actually represent a particular number. But a very special heart uh, at heart, what we have at Cambridge is misconceptions. We all know as math teachers that children are going to make a mistake at this pace. But what we need to bring in front of them are what are the common misconceptions that happen? Just the way we have FAQs, we must have the CMs. So the misconceptions are something like this. Numbers with more digits are always greater. That's what children think. You know, a child, this, is, uh, this has more numbers, this must definitely be greater. How to address this? Engage students in hands-on activities. And I've given you many ideas and probably block base. Another misconception which I think exists in every mind is zero does not matter in a number. Give them money, it really matters once it comes to money. Whether they have a 20 no rupee note or a 200 rupee note, it'll matter. So try that. Common misconception number three, all numbers are same, uh, uh, all numbers with the same digits are equal. No, they are not. So please encourage them to explore different numbers with same digits, different combinations, let them compare, let them showcase so that they know the value of each number. I'm going to come down to the last bit. I know I'm almost running out of time. Vandana, do I have time? Yes, ma'am, we can continue. Okay. Project-based learning is something I think all of us want to genuinely get involved with. And we want to do a lot uh, of project-based learning. Uh, while doing this, there are certain elements that must be very important and kept in mind. I'm going to focus on these. One of the elements is you must start with a driving question. Not every child is interested in project-based learning. Not every child finds uh, you know, uh, this very easy. It's very intimidating when you say we're going to do a project-based learning. They feel as if, you know, I would have done it on a worksheet. Why do I need to get involved in a project? So start with a driving question or a challenge. The question is in front of you. An example. Have a real world context, very important. For example, you know, let's say we are doing a place value in everyday life, large numbers, price tags. Yeah, um, any kind of numbers where you find large numbers, even under QR codes, you have these big numbers written on the tags. Use those, use data spreadsheets, um, in-depth inquiry, not just surface. Ask them to uh, not only delve into the play concept of place value by examining each uh, numbers position, but understand the importance of what that number is, what changing a digit will have an effect on, on the overall value. And they have to explain. They don't just have to say it. Not one of them just has to say it. They have to show an impact. Student voice is very important. Choose methods which actually showcase, you know, their understanding, hands-on activities, group discussions, visual representations, my best friends. 
interdisciplinary connections, I think I've showcased enough. And that's something I would say you uh, plays a very crucial role and you must try and bring it into your teaching learning processes. The last piece is always the best piece. And that is a public product. You know, it's always said that within your home, you can do whatever you want. But when you are outside of your home, you're at the best behavior possible, right? Take that clue. And taking from that clue, go ahead and, you know, give them a project uh, or a product which is going to become public. So a public product really, really helps because they have to showcase, they're going to make it nice, they're going to think about it. So that aesthetic value also sets in. I cannot emphasize enough on the role of reflection. They have to pause to see what is their progress made at every stage. So if not every day, uh, if not every second or third day, definitely over a week, at least on a Friday, please pause for them to reflect. See what challenges they are facing. What are their success points and let them celebrate their achievements. Interdisciplinary connections are important for them to draw. And of course, there are multiple here, multiple more examples over here. Time permitting, I would have actually gone through everything. But I think I've given you an idea. And for teachers, we simply need to ignite or show you the right direction. And you know which direction to take it to. So we trust that you're going to do that. But the biggest part of all is assessment. Yes, assessment has to be ongoing and multifaceted between observations, student self-assessment, peer evaluation, and project representation. So you have to actually cater to everything in one uh, go. Along with your formative assessments, I've spoken about it, performance tasks like your dances, your patterns, your game making, rubrics. I cannot move forward without mentioning rubrics. Here's a sample for you. Please notice this sample rubric gauges everything from understanding to application, to creativity, to communication and organization. So it's not just conceptual understanding, but everything that you have been, uh, you know, uh, the students have been showcasing, understanding, ap applying and doing everything to do with number sense and place value. 